I'm Naisha McCauley and you're watching AccessTV.org. Good morning and welcome to the challenge. As always, first and foremost, I'd like to thank God for another opportunity and thank you, the viewers, for tuning in. A very, very up close and personal uh, view of the Hartford Public Schools. Uh, we want to take you inside uh, the Hartford Public Schools and have you take a, a first-hand look at uh, uh, what's happening within the schools uh, and uh, have you talk to, uh, have you listen to, if you will, someone who uh, is intimately involved in the uh, upkeep of those facilities. Uh, environment is everything. The environment that our kids are going into uh, to learn uh, is not just uh, the, the teachers or the staff who are, are in those schools, but it is actually the facilities uh, themselves. We're here this morning with uh, Levy Cordulis. Uh, Levy is a former president of the union, uh, Union 566 yes. uh, custodians uh, in the Hartford Public School System. He's been uh, you know, a custodian uh, for many, many years uh, and has a, a passion and a, and a special interest, if you will, in uh, uh, the Hartford school system. Good morning. Good morning. Well, you know, it's a pleasure to, to have you here this morning. Uh, you know, I, it's been quite a, uh, uh, a long time coming, if you will, for really just a lack of a better way of putting it, because I think most people take for granted uh, the maintenance of schools and the upkeep of schools, but uh, they uh, think that it's, it's somehow it's, a, it's an automatic thing that gets done, uh, you know, regardless if you're dealing with a 150,000 square foot school or a 200,000 square foot school with, with grounds and all of those kinds of things. Talk to us about what it takes to uh, uh, keep up uh, a school uh, with, uh, you know, four or five hundred students, um, maybe 50 to 60 teachers, uh, administrators, grounds. Uh, how many people are we looking at uh, that actually take care of those kinds of schools within the school system? Well, first they determine the size of the building um, and the amount, the population of students inside that building. Uh -huh. That was the formula that we use for many years in our school district to determine how many custodians you would need to maintain that property. Mm. So a school like 150,000 square feet with about 700 students, you would have normally five custodians to maintain that property, okay. plus the uh, maintenance staff, the tradesmen uh, to come in and do any repairs like carpenters, electricians, plumbers, things of that nature. Mm. And how how much time are they generally uh, allotted in terms of uh, doing their uh, you know normal duties? Uh, how much time is allotted for them? Are they uh, nine to five employees, or do they work weekends? W what's the case? Well, it all depends. Uh, traditional regular school hours um, for a, a day custodian usually is seven to four or 6.30 to 3.30. So day custodians would be there for nine hours. You get a duty, an hour duty free lunch. Um, then you would have the night crew comes in. Uh, traditionally, the night crew used to come in at three o'clock. Uh -huh. But now with all the cuts, um, we're talking about schools like with 150,000 square feet right. and 700 students. Right. You're down to three custodians. Mm. And you, you, you went from seven to three? Well, went to five, to, five to three. To three. To three. Oh wow! And, and so, one hundred fifty thousand square feet. You only got five, uh, and now you're down to three. Yeah. Now, how many how many classrooms are we talking about? Give us give us sort of the architectural 
uh, makeup of the uh, of the school? Well, uh, we could use a school, let's say like Clark School, um, since that's been in the forefront. That's an elementary school with yes. approximately three, four hundred students. In? Yes. Okay. Yes, uh, approximately one hundred and fifty thousand square feet. Okay. Amounts. Okay. Um, you know, you're working by yourself until twelve, one o'clock every day because you're down to three custodians. So. Uh, Elementary schools pose a very unique situation because you have little babies in the school. Yeah. You got the kindergarten kids, you got right. the first grade, the second grade. Sure. So they're going to do something a little bit different than they will, let's say, at Bulkley High School. The one more more mature. Exactly. Okay, sure. So now you, you're you going to work even more because, you know, Russell just had an a accident in the classroom. Levy just, you know, had an accident in the restroom. Yeah. So now I got to go, you know, make sure I, I address that sure. while I'm making sure um, I, I've taken care of the breakfast because the kids got to eat breakfast. Right. So the trash got to get out. We got to get ready for lunch. Wow. Plus, you know, any deliveries that happen during the course of the day. Um, you're also your own clerical worker because you do all the work orders, all the work schedules, all the ordering. You do all of that. For all, this, all the supplies you may need for all of the restrooms, yes. for all of the classrooms, and all of the, uh, you have to do all of that yourself? Yes. That's not done coordinated through um, any central source at all. It's done within that school by the custodian himself. By the head custodian. Yes. Uh, I, I'm still trying to come to grips with, I'm trying to imagine uh, you covering that kind of <laughs> ground within a, within a school day. You're talking 150,000 square feet, uh, which also includes the grounds, the grounds. outside. Yes, right? yes. And uh, at Clark Elementary School, it's unique. It's an elementary school that deals with, uh, with, with, with uh, you know, kids elementary age, um, I, I just can't imagine it being done. I mean, I, 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 forgive me, but I'm a little, um, uh, you know, disturbed by it. We all I, should be. Yeah. This, this is disturbing. So now your child yeah. is going to, this, to a school that's not clean, right. that's not safe, that's not healthy. Yeah. You know, and, and one of the other things that, you know, with the magnet schools, they get additional funds. Right. But they'll still only have three custodians as well because this is what's coming out of the district. Say, hey, that's all you need. Right. You only need the three, they can get it done. So who determines, there is a formula in place according to uh, people who create formulas for schools that basically say a custodian or three custodians should be able to handle a 150,000 square foot school. Is that what I'm hearing? Is there some kind of formula out there? There's a, some there, kind of there was a formula that we used to use. Uh -huh. And the formula took the square footage of the school, the amount of students in that building. Right. They didn't factor in so much the grounds, but they should because in uh, surrounding communities, it's yeah. the town services that do the grounds, not the custodians of the school. So if it's a snowstorm, say in Bloomfield, right. those custodians aren't coming outside to do the snow removal. Right. Town services come and do the snow removal. But but in your case, mm -hmm. in Hartford, you have to come out and do the snow removal. 100%. So we, we have to do that. So, you know, going back to Clark School, you have three custodians. Now it snows and it's a delay. It's a two-hour delay. Right. You're there by yourself. You're alone until 12, 1 o'clock. The other custodian, what they do, they offer that individual um, overtime right. to come in. You don't have to take that overtime to come in early on your shift on a Wednesday. Right. You know, so now you got to go outside by yourself, right. do the grounds. Plus, regardless if it's a 90 minute delay, we still got to give those babies breakfast. Right. And we still got to clean up behind that. It's even more work on a delay. This is, this is impossible to me. I mean, how how in the world can one person be expected to maintain a school that size to make sure that it's safe, to make sure it's clean? You know, it's impossible. Yeah, it is. And I just can't see how folks don't see that. And then there's this uh, angst and this, you know, this frustration about, you know, how uh, well the schools are kept. 
you know, problems with graffitis and problems with, uh, uh, you know, malfunctioning, uh, you know, mechanical systems and electrical systems and, you know, having, uh, you know, the proper tools and all of those things that go into making sure that people can, can be given a good education in a place where, uh, you know, it's suitable for them to learn and they only have one person up until 12 o'clock. Yes. Every wow. day. Every day. It, and it's tough for schools like that. Uh, and it's not just Clark. Right. It's Sands. It's Simpson Waverly. It's Milner. It's um, McDonough. All of these are public schools. Yes. All of these are public All of these are public And how schools. long has this been going on, uh, Levy? Well, since the good Dr. Adamowski came, you know, he, he found a way to start cutting, you know, the, the blue collar worker. And, and no one's, you know, made an effort to put it back together. It's astonishing to me. Yeah. Uh, you know, it seems to me, you know, that the, the very thing that people are talking uh, or neglecting, if you will, they should be talking about. Yes. Because if a person who is uh, coming to learn is not coming into an environment that is suited to, to learning, how can they expect, you know, the person who, who's come to learn to, you know, to get an adequate education? That's a very good question. That's a very good question. Because what, what it seems to be, what's going on in Hartford now, we have two separate districts. We got the magnet schools and we got everybody else. So the magnet schools, they get all the bells and whistles. They get the additional monies uh, from the state through grants. Right. Plus the, the, the traditional uh, funding that the city gives the Board of Ed. So they, they have all of this money. They, they're able to buy all of this awesome equipment, have beautiful facilities. Right. But then we could go to Burns and it's virtually nothing. You know, I was the head custodian at Burns uh, before I got to Bulkley. And that summer that I started there, they brought me to the pre-K room right. upstairs, um, right. 114, 116. And when I walked in that room, there was fuzz all over the carpet. That's mold. Yeah. The ceiling was drooping. I mean, I, I've never seen any. And I've been in the district, uh, Friday, funny, is my anniversary, 24 years. So I've been in the district for a minute. I've never seen a drooping ceiling like that. So immediately I go up to the rooftop and I see all the little circles on the rooftop. That's the contractor, leap, leap, leap. So we get the contractor and he comes and he takes a sample of the, the roof, uh, right. where you can see all the different levels. Right. Come to find out there's no fiberboard on the roof. So we've been paying a contractor to come and patch a roof with no fiberboard. It's never gonna work. So subsequently, you know, after a lot of, uh, a, a smaller problem becomes larger. Huge problem now. It's a huge problem. And now let's remember, this is pre-K. These babies are sleeping on the little cots that are, what, six, ten inches off the, right. the floor. So right. you're in a carpeted room, which you shouldn't have any wall-to-wall -wall carpeting in schools right. at all. Right. The, the ceiling has no fiberboard on it. The, the room, it just reeked of mold, mildew, and moisture. And there's all kinds of long-term... Uh, repercussions from yes. things like that. I yes. mean, uh, I think insurance companies would be alarmed, yes. quite frankly. Uh, and I'm not sure if the city has, or the Board of Education has risk managers. I know there's been a real big issue about, you know, the insurance within the city of Hartford. Uh, I'm wondering if the risk manager who is, who is trying to keep tabs on payments is also, you know, inspecting these buildings to make certain that um, you know, that, that they are health hazards, like that, what you're referring to. Well, I, I can tell you from experience, no risk manager ever walked around with me at Burns for, for me to show them all the ills in that building, which was a lot. Yeah. And, but they have subsequently, you know, because I pushed and I hemmed and I hauled because that's how I work. Sure. We got a new roof on that part of right, it. Right. You know, we got their carpeting removed. Right. We were able to fix all that moisture in there. But those children were exposed for this is how they were going to school up until the time I started there. And so they didn't finish that roof 
until 2011. That is, uh, I think, going to, to be uh, something that the city of Hartford will have to deal with in the future because uh, I just don't see how uh, being exposed to that kind of condition for the length of time that they were exposed to, that there wasn't some kind of uh, uh, illness or something contracted. I'm certain that they were, um, you know, they were impacted by it. They oh, had yeah. to be. Oh, well, yeah. when we started talking about asthma, yeah. you know, all of the breathing, and, and the air quality already in these schools, if you don't have operational fan rooms, right. room mechanical rooms, some people call them, so where we could take the air and move it through the building. Right. So now if that's not even working, now the air gets stagnant, right. makes it even worse. Right. Right. So then when you do have uh, an issue like, you know, in room 114, 116 at Burns, it just it, it's compounded. Yeah. This is fascinating to me. Uh, I also want to say too, uh, and we're going to take a break right here and come back. Uh, that uh, Levy Cardulis is also interested in running for city council. I think he would bring something very unique uh, to the city council. We want to hear him talk about, uh, you know, what kinds of contribution he's interested in making to this process. Uh, to this democracy that we uh, supposedly are all engaged in and hopefully, hopefully uh, can, can produce some kinds of results that uh, all of us in the city of Hartford uh, and urban America can appreciate. Uh, we're going to take a break right here, but we'll be right back with Levy Cardulis to talk about his candidacy, candidacy for uh, the city council uh, in Hartford, Connecticut. Hi, and welcome to AccessTV.org. I'm your host from Shaping the Next Generation, Naima Jackson. Welcome to AccessTV.org. We're your hosts, Naima Jackson. And I'm Elijah Williams. Thank you for tuning in to Shaping the Next Generation. Today's special guest is Ms. Vicki Gallen-Clark. Ms. Vicki will stop by on the show to talk about her role in the Blue Hill Civic Association. Now, if you haven't heard about Blue Hill Civic Association, you should definitely look into it. It's located on Asylum. Now, if you don't know anything about Blue Hills, you should know that Blue Hill Civic Association, they will definitely help you get a step forward in your future. They'll help you figure out what you want to be in the future because they definitely helped me. I figured out what I want my career to be, I figured out what college I want to go to, and I figured out what I want to major in. Blue Hills helped me because they helped me learn how to write a resume, a cover letter. They prepared me for an interview to get a job. Blue Hills Civic Association is definitely the perfect program for our youth today. Now, thank you for joining us on AccessTV.org. I like AccessTV.org because they offer us highlights on our local community that you don't get from Channel 3 or Fox News. They also have us gave us highlights from sports like track and field. So thank you so much for joining us. And all the youth out there, you should definitely join us at Access TV and definitely check out Blue Hill Civic Association because it will help you, it will motivate you to get out there, look into our programs, and it will help you shape your future. We're back uh, at the challenge with uh, Levy Cardulis, uh, former president of local Union 566 Custodians. Uh, we're, we've just had an up close and personal view of what takes place within the Harvard public school systems. Uh, we have talked to him at length about uh, the conditions that exist uh, with the facilities themselves and why. And quite frankly, uh, the uh, conversation we've had has left me astonished. Uh, but, you know, I think it's, it's astonishing to me what uh, Mr. Levy, uh, Mr. Cordulis here, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, you know, uh, puts it so plain that, uh, you know, it's now 
very necessary that we address it. And it's not just knowing about it, but actually doing something about it. And uh, that kind of leads me up to him and his candidacy, if you will, uh, for Hartford City Council. I uh, understand you're interested in running for council, uh, Mr. Kadoulis. Is that a fact? 100%. You know, it's interesting, you know, a lot of folks get into politics for a lot of different reasons, um, but, you know, it's obvious to me that your passion for this city, uh, for the kids, uh, your work here, uh, you know, speaks for who you are uh, and speaks to me uh, about the character and the kind of person uh, that you are, which is one of the reasons why I was so happy that you consented to being on the show today. Uh, one of the things I, I want to talk about, though, is what are some of those issues that you feel that we need to deal with right away that would change the conditions uh, that exist for all of us, if you will, in the city of Hartford? Give me, if you will, uh, some of the priorities, if you will, uh, that you uh, would try to address as a member of city council that could change uh, the way uh, things are done in the city of Hartford? Well, we're talking about the second poorest city in the nation here in Hartford, Connecticut now. Um, my first priority would be, is to put people back to work. Okay. People need to be working. We have too many unemployed individuals in the city of Hartford. Okay. Once people are working, they start feeling better about themselves. They feel better about their, their neighborhood, their community. They want to do more. They want to keep their outside clean. Where are those jobs coming from, though? Well, th that's what we got to work on. Um, you saw President Obama, he was talking about the uh, high-tech positions. Okay. Made me immediately think about Pratt & Whitney, Standard Dine, Hamilton Standard, all of the uh, electric boat, all of these industries in Connecticut and mm -hmm. the surrounding in Hartford, you know, with Pratt and mm -hmm. uh, Hamilton's Standard Dine. Why aren't we being well, coming a hub for these high-tech Positions. But, but let's look also at the jobs that do exist yes. within the Hartford, uh, within Hartford, and within uh, the city of Hartford. Uh, jobs that you know uh, are part of yes. the uh, the the system itself, like the ones uh, that you do. Yeah. Uh, the Hartford Public Schools. Let's see, public safety. Um, you know, you know, that's fire and police and all those kinds of yes. things. What about residency? Is that an issue for you? Yes. I would like people, heads of departments, uh, public safety to be in the city. Um, if there's an emergency and I live in Hebron, you know, it's going to take me about an hour to get here. Yeah. Instead of going into one of our awesome neighborhoods in the city of Hartford. So a lot of beautiful houses that have just been totally neglected. Mm -hmm. Move into one of the neighborhoods, start bringing the neighborhood up. Now you have a sense of, of community responsibility. You have a sense of ownership in the town in which you serve mm. and who gives you money. And, sure. and, and these, some of these individuals are making some pretty good money. Yeah, yeah. I would like you to live inside yeah. the city. You, you, you made the argument uh, uh, in public settings that if uh, the uh, residents of the city of Hartford uh, were the residents of any other town that the uh, position that they take for residency for residents being a part of uh, you know public safety and, and uh, part of uh, you know the public school system had those kinds of jobs that they would be making the same argument that you have with making sure that those people who live in, in those cities actually had those jobs in the city. Is that a position that you continue to hold? Oh yeah, wholeheartedly. Okay. Wholeheartedly. Cause the only way we're gonna build Hartford back is from within. We're not gonna be able to get people from outside of Hartford to help us reestablish us inside the city. Mm. We have to take it on and say, all right, let me dust myself off, let me let me get it together, and let me move forward so I can build my community. Well, what's the makeup of your union right now? How many of the union that you were former president of 
are actual residents of the city of Hartford. Or the local 566. Yeah. You're talking about 65, 70% of those members are city residents because I represented the custodians, the tradesmen, and the food service workers. Uh -huh. The majority of the food service workers all live in Hartford. Uh -huh. More than half of the custodians live in Hartford. Uh -huh. um, a few of the tradesmen, you know, they live outside of Hartford, but there's a couple that definitely live inside mm -hmm. the city. Now, I'm also concerned too, you know, I know people talk about, you know, jobs, but um, I'm, I'm also wondering too, how do you get uh, you know, the educational system uh, back on par because everybody is moving to, uh, you know, charter schools and all these, the magnet schools. And you made the point already that uh, uh, you feel that uh, uh, the public schools have been neglected for a lot of years and that even now with the uh, changing of to charter schools and magnet schools, they're being neglected even more so. Now, how do you how do you propose we do something about that? Well, I was extremely disappointed with the superintendent search. Um, I didn't like that they brought us all in when they had the final two candidates. Mm. Um, the the one that they selected, she's you know she's both of them were awesome, mm -hmm. period. But neither one of them knew anything about chef. And when we went to uh, the discussions with them. The landmark decision, Chef yeah, versus O'Neill. The, the Chef versus yeah, O'Neill. Okay. And which I think is so pertinent here inside the city that right. we, you have to know about that. Mm. And they didn't. My thing is, why are we getting someone that's more connected with our community? You cannot tell me that there's not one or five or ten educators in either in Hartford or the greater Hartford community. Mm hmm that would have been outstanding superintendents for the city of Hartford mm -hmm. and would come into this position and I know they want to do the portfolio thing which I don't agree with at all but now you're going to come with passion because this is your community mm -hmm. so now when we get transplants is what I call them the, the people that are coming and going right. they're not committed to the community mm -hmm. they're committed to the three P's mm -hmm. the pension the paycheck and the perception of power <laughs> And, and that's all it is, because uh, you're not here on the weekends, you're not here at I, night. Yeah, yeah. So what are we doing? Yeah, and why are we hiring outside all the time? The Doesn't three, make me feel the good. The three Ps, pension, paychecks, and the perception of power. The perception so of power. So it, it's not even a, an actuality, it's a, something that's perceived. So, exactly, yeah. exactly. You know, it's, it's interesting that you would say that, because uh, I think by and large, you know, most people uh, take on those jobs as policy makers on city council, uh, and forget that they're there to, to be public servants. Yes. And they often talk about governing. And, uh, you know, uh, the issue is is whether or not they actually understand the needs of the people they're supposed to be serving. Right. And so, so what, we're, what we're talking about with uh, uh, Levy Cardulis and his candidacy is a person who um, is at the grassroots level dealing with uh, the real problems, you know, that our kids are facing, that our communities are facing with having sort of, uh, you know, kids that are being neglected, schools that are being neglected, uh, and, and actually uh, talking about, you know, solutions to uh, the problems of, of uh, how do you change those kinds of uh, dynamics within the school. Is that a fair uh, synopsis of, of where you are at this Absolutely. point? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Absolutely. So, so now, given because uh, there's some tough decisions that have to be made, uh, what would what would you say would be uh, something that you know? I mean, within the first hundred days of you being on council, once you were elected to city council, that you try to do oh, what? The, the parks. The, the parks. The parks would be first on, on uh, my list. In the first 100 days, I would be making sure that we have adequate parks for our children and our families. Oh. Um, I used to run Hartford Elementary basketball. Um, we grew it to 22 elementary schools. We were, every Monday, Wednesday, it was beautiful. Go around the city, games are going on at these schools. You had cheerleaders, pitter-patter of, of, of right, sneakers right, in the gymnasium. Right, right. It's just beautiful. Yeah, you know, right. we had midget football, stuff right. I alluded to before. Yeah. All of that's gone. Wow. 
is gone. There's one yeah. football team, the Wildcats, wow. which they're awesome, but it's one team. You know, when we had the, uh, yeah. the midget program, right, right. we had teams all, all across the city, right. ABC. Right. That's when people knew each other. People knew each you other. You know, and people yeah. people got out of their homes yes. and, you know, they came yes. out to support their children. Yes. And they and they, you know, they congregated because they, you know, had the same kinds of interest in and exactly. what was happening in their community. Exactly. What happened to that? We started we, we went to this business style. When when uh, Eddie took yeah, over yeah. as mayor, uh, you know, coming out of Trinity College uh, and everything that was going on with Trinity trying to make the neighborhood better, because, you know, that's, that's a private company there. Right. <laughs> they, they're, they're in competition with Amherst and Colby, all of these really nice communities. Uh, you know, they're in competition for those same kind of kids. Oh. So it's important for Trinity to say, hey, you know what? Yeah, we got the gangs and everything around Frog Hollow, but we're going to make it better. Uh, so Eddie coming out of there, I already had a slanted eye with Eddie. And then he declared himself CEO of the city of Hartford. Yeah. And it started that portfolio mantra that we're still following right now. Mm. And from that point on, it's just been going down hill. And no uh, one seems to want to change that. And it's time that we all need to change that. That's interesting, uh, the perspective that you have. You know, I know, you know, Hartford is your city. You know, you, you love it and, you yes. know, you've passionate about, you know, what takes place here. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if, uh, uh, you know, when do you officially announce your candidacy? Are you, are you doing it here today on the program? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 I'm going to officially announce it after I fill out the papers at the Secretary of the State's office okay. in January. Okay. Because the election is next year, November. So okay. I'll, uh, January, we got to go down and put in our papers. Okay. But, um, Unofficially, yeah. you know, without the papers, right. I'm definitely announcing my candidacy right here. Well, we we thank you for uh, we are, giving us this. giving us the opportunity to be uh, the ones to uh, to share that with the community first. Uh, you know, I I think that you know that your uh, um, your passion and your empathy speaks volumes. Uh, I think that it's you know somebody you're definitely somebody who is connected to the community, to the grassroots community. Yes. Um, and you're somebody who obviously loves Hartford oh, yeah. uh, a lot. I, I just can't help but wonder, though, if, uh, you know, you can really prepare for uh, the, the arena of politics. <laughs> you know, the arena of politics is, uh, uh, man, it's almost a blood sport, it seems, at times. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, people get hurt. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, you know, people that you think you know uh, and have been around for many, many years aren't quite what you think they are and true. who you think they are. And uh, are you prepared for those kinds of uh, challenges? Yes, you are. I, I'm prepared for that. See, I, I never, I wasn't always thinking, oh, I want to run for office. Um, you know, I'm going to be a politician. No, I've always been an activist who just got sick and tired of what they they were seeing. Yeah, the status quo, huh? Okay. Yeah, I'm yeah. tired. I'm tired. And then, no, I don't even want to use the word tired because that's almost like defeatist. Right. I'm not defeated. Right. So I'm not tired. I'm, it's just time for us Hartford people who care about our city to bring it back and make it better for our children, our grandchildren, right. our neighbors. Sure. This is important. Yeah. And so... I know the political arena, especially here in Hartford, gets real dirty. Right. But again, you know, I'm a blue collar guy. I bring my lunch pail. Right. Um, I never, I, my intention wasn't to run for public office. Right. Uh, until I became the union president. And sure. then I started seeing so many things that need to get done. Right, right. And so um, had a change of mind right. and, and here I am. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty obvious that you're accustomed to, to covering a lot of ground. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, literally covering a lot of ground. I oh, mean, yeah. you know, being uh, responsible for uh, our schools and uh, uh, those are huge facilities and having done it uh, with the kind of um, uh, dignity and purpose that you've done yes. uh, for so many years, I mean, uh, uh, I think uh, it's time to bring that sort of thing out of the shadows. Yes. and and into the public view uh, for all of us to, you know, to, to give some t testimony to. 
Uh, you know, it's been a pleasure, man. Yes, sir. You know, time comes and goes, you know, kind yeah. of fast yeah, on these shows. Yeah, it does. Uh, but we'll have to do a follow-up. Oh, 100%. Yeah, Let's do it. Yeah, we'll have to do a follow-up, man. And uh, let me be the first to say, man, I wish you well in your Thank candidacy, you. man. And, and I think you'll make a good public service. Thank you. I appreciate that also. Thank it, you for having me on here. It's been a pleasure to speak to Mr. Stevie Cardulis this morning on The Challenge. Uh, remember... Be blessed.